When I first became a Christian, the thing that really blew me away above anything else, pretty much, is that the Holy Bible predicts the future. Yeah. And、uh, you know, I had been raised an atheist. I had read my horoscopes, and they were so vague that they could pretty much apply to half the population, no matter what horoscope you were reading. I had seen Russell Grant on TV. I'd seen Mystic Meg. I had heard about the prophecies of Nostradamus. I was familiar with the concept of foretelling the future. But the only problem was, every single source that I went to to kind of see if someone really had the power to foretell the future, it kind of was a bit naff. It was a bit watered down. It was a bit rubbish. It was kind of like guesswork, and they produced so many predictions, so many prophecies that just by statistical probability—and I got that word out, so be proud of me—statistical、well、probability, you have to be right every now and then. But their hit rate was so so low. And then I came to the Holy Bible and I began to read the Bible, and we need to understand like the Bible is like seventy percent prophecy. That's what it is. It's either、uh, God speaking to the church or the nation of Israel here and there, or it's foretelling something that's going to happen in the future. And what's really amazing, and for me when I was a young Christian, really weird and strange, is that every single prediction the Holy Bible makes, whether hundreds of years in advance or thousands of years in advance, every single prediction comes true. And some of these predictions, they're not like vague. It mentions people's names. It mentions people. It mentions the places where people are going to be. It mentions empires and kingdoms. It gives you timescales as to when these things are going to occur. And in the New Testament, we've got this book called the Book of Revelation. And the Book of Revelation is almost entirely prophetic. It's about the future and what's going to happen in this world. Just before Jesus returns, and within the Book of Revelation, there are these two really super interesting characters called the two witnesses, and these are two Jewish men who are prophesying because they're prophets in the city of Jerusalem in Israel, just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so today we're going to be looking at. The identity of these two witnesses, what their ministry is, how they were already predict,、uh, predicted in the Old Testament, and what the fulfilment of that is going to be in the future. And we're going to have a time at the end as well for Q and A. So if you've got any questions about prophecy, about what's going to happen in the end times, it's called eschatology. It's a big fancy word theologians like to throw around. But end times, if you've got any questions at all, you can ask them. Okay, we're open to questioning in this church. You can question me about anything, and if I don't know the answer, we can ask Chat GPT for. Right? Okay, two witnesses. Let's go to the first scripture, the next screen, and we go all the way back in time to this prophet called Zechariah. And Zechariah was given all of these amazing visions by God, and many of them pertain to the last days, the kind of days that we're heading towards right now. And in this one vision, Zechariah has he sees this golden menorah, which is a Jewish lampstand that you can kind of see on there. He sees this menorah, and it's lit. But beside this menorah are these two olive trees, and the branch from each olive tree stretches towards this menorah, and this golden olive oil is pouring from these two trees. And the oil is flowing into this menorah and causing the menorah to burn brightly with the with the oil that it's consuming as fuel. And so Zechariah is looking at this. He's seeing the menorah, the seven candles. He can see the two olive trees. He can see this golden oil flowing into the basin on top of the menorah, and it's feeding the menorah fuel to burn. And Zechariah is looking at this. He's like, "What's this about?" This is a weird vision. <laughs> uh, uh, two trees. There's a candelabra. There's a menorah. There's okay. There's oil. W- what does this even mean? And so he begins to question the angel who's standing there with him. And the angel says,、uh, "Then I asked the angel, 'What are these two olive trees on the right and on the left of the lampstand?' Again, I asked the angel, 'What are these two olive branches besides?'" 
the two golden pipes that pour out the golden oil. And the angel replied, Do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I said. So the angel said, These are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. So you've got this image of the menorah, the candlestick holder. You've got these two olive trees that are pouring oil into this menorah. And Zechariah is looking at it and he says, I don't know what this is. And the angel says, you don't? He says, no, I don't know what, what this is. And the angel says, these two olive trees are the two that stand before the Lord of all the earth. And they are pouring oil into this menorah. Hmm. Okay, what does that even mean? Now, for those of you who are theologians amongst us and you've been to Bible study, what does the menorah represent as a symbol in the Bible? What does it represent? Big clue, it's a country in the world. Israel. Israel. And when you fly into Israel, you see this huge menorah, okay, when you get off the airport, because the menorah is a symbol of? The men- we're going to do this again. The menorah is? Israel. Israel. Okay, so the biblical symbol of Israel as a nation, as a people, as the Jewish people, is the menorah. The menorah. When we study the scriptures, what does oil or golden oil represent? A bit louder. Holy Spirit. Yes, okay. And this is why when you read a few verses on, God responds by saying it's not by might. It's not by power. It is by my spirit, says the Lord. So you've got these two olive trees and they are producing this oil, which is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And where is the oil being poured into? Israel. The menorah, Israel. And what's it causing the menorah to become? Light. Light. And so we have this depiction that there are these two that stand before the Lord of the whole earth. And they are going to bring the oil to cause Israel to be saved. So important. During Jesus' ministry on earth, he traveled the length and breadth of Israel, healing the sick, driving out demonic spirits, resurrecting the dead. He walked upon the waves of the sea. And why did he do this? When we go to the book of Job, in the book of Job, it says the one who stretches out the heavens, that's God. He alone can walk upon the waves of the sea. So when Jesus appeared in Israel, he walked upon the waves of the sea, not because he was showing off, but because he wanted his disciples to realize and recognize who he really is. He is the one who created the universe. He is the one who stretches out the heavens. Only the one who walks upon the waves is the one who creates the universe. Jesus revealed to his own people, Israel, that he was the promised Messiah. He performed miracle after miracle. He revealed to them who he was. And yet, the leadership of Israel rejected him as the Messiah. Why did they do this? Was it because he didn't fulfill the Old Testament prophecies? No, he fulfilled them to the letter. Was it because he wasn't performing the miracles? that the Messiah was supposed to perform. No, he was performing all of the miracles. So why did the leadership of Israel reject him as the Messiah? Because Jesus is the truth. And whenever Jesus speaks, Jesus must speak the truth. So whenever he met with the religious leadership of Israel, he told them the truth. You are liars. You are thieves. You are blasphemers. You are hypocrites. Instead of welcoming people into the kingdom of God, you shut them out with your religion. Jesus spoke the truth to the religious leadership of his day. And because he spoke the truth to them, and he rebuked them, and he corrected them publicly, they hated him for it. 
even though he was performing the miracles, even though he was fulfilling the prophecies, they rejected him on the grounds of blasphemy because he claimed to be the son of God. They rejected him as demon possessed. They rejected him as an enchanter or a magician. And when you read the Jewish writings of the rabbis today, they talk about Jesus quite a lot. And they never deny he existed. They never deny that he was crucified by Pontius Pilate. They don't even deny that his tomb was empty on the third day. They deny he was the Messiah. They say he was a magician. He was a sorcerer. He was a deceiver. They don't even deny that he performed miracles. They saw too many of them. But they had to find a reason to reject him. And so they said, instead of being the son of God, you're the son of Satan. That's why we reject you. And it's true today, isn't it? When you tell somebody about their sin, do they love you for it? Or do they turn? When you speak truth today, do, do people want to hear truth? Or do they want their ears tickled? And when you speak to the religious leadership of this country, do they embrace us warmly and welcome us and say, yes, we are hypocrites, fantastic. Or do they want to persecute us and reject us? It's always been the same. And so on this one occasion, the religious leaders, the hypocrites of Israel came to Jesus and said, give us a sign. Give us another sign to prove that you're on the Messiah. And he says, I will no longer give signs to this wicked and adulterous generation. You have rejected me as your Messiah. You called me the son of Satan. I will no longer perform signs, wonders and miracles as evidence for you. But one sign I will give to Israel as a nation, just one. It will be the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, who can tell me what the sign of Jonah is? The sign of resurrection. You see, the prophet Jonah, he, he didn't want to go to Nineveh because the Ninevites were the enemies of Israel. Jonah hated the Ninevites. So he jumped on a ship to Spain to get as far away from Nineveh as possible. But God sent a huge fish, most likely a whale, to come along and gobble up Jonah. And Jonah died in the belly of the fish. He stopped breathing. He sunk down to the depths of the ocean. He died. And then God resurrected Jonah inside the belly of the fish. And then the fish spewed Jonah up upon the dry land. And he went to Nineveh and proclaimed the message and saved those people. Jesus said, no sign will be given to this nation of Israel apart from the sign of resurrection, the sign of Jonah. And this sign will come three times. The first time this sign came was with the resurrection of Lazarus. And for those of you who watch The Chosen, you'll see the next episode. We're going to be looking at the resurrection of Lazarus. It's so, so, so very, very good. The resurrection of Lazarus was a public miracle for Israel. People knew who he was. It's just outside of Jerusalem. It was a busy time of year. And many people had come to the grave to mourn. Jesus stood there and says, Lazarus, come out. He resurrects Lazarus in full view of all, the, all of the religious leadership. And how do they respond to that resurrection of Lazarus? Brilliant, Jesus, you are the Messiah. No. Right, now we want to kill Jesus and we want to kill Lazarus. I mean, poor Lazarus, he's just been dead. I don't want to kill him again. That's their response. That's how religious people always respond when you tell them the truth. They want to kill you. They want to shut you up. They want to cancel you, shut you down. Keep being lights, my friends. Keep speaking truth. So that was the first sign of Jonah and Israel rejected it. The second sign of Jonah then came along. They crucified the son of God on the cross he took the penalty for your sin and my sin upon himself on the cross. And then he died. He was buried in the tomb of a member of the Sanhedrin called Joseph, who was from Arimathea. They buried him in his tomb. And on the third day, God vindicated Jesus of Nazareth by resurrecting him from the dead, proving to all of mankind that he really is the son of the living God. And he appeared alive to more than 500 witnesses over a period of 40 days, showing evidence and proof that he really is resurrected. And how did Israel respond to this? Did they turn, did the, the religious leadership turn around and say, wow, Jesus has been resurrected. No, the, the disciples must have stolen his body. Let's persecute the church. Let's persecute the Christians. Let's kill them. 
They couldn't deny the tomb was empty, but they had to find a naturalistic reason why Jesus was no longer there. They rejected the second sign of Jonah. But there is coming a third sign of Jonah. Let's go to the next screen. We turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 11, verses 1 to 8. And now we are looking into the future. This may be 50 years away, 100 years away, but it's in the future from when we're living right now. This is during a time called the tribulation period. This is when God begins to bring judgments upon the earth like he did to Pharaoh in Egypt. He will do worldwide to bring people to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. And God says, I will appoint my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1,260 days. How long is that? Three and a half years. How long is the tribulation? Seven years. And so for the first three and a half years, let me do it this way, for the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, these two witnesses are going to be prophesying. First three and a half years. Once you reach the middle point, you've got another three and a half years until the return of Jesus. Okay. God says, I'm going to appoint my two witnesses and they will prophesy for three and a half years. That's Jewish years, of course. Clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees. Now, where did we hear about two olive trees before? Zechariah. Zechariah. And the two lampstands. And they stand before the Lord of the whole earth. If anyone tries to harm these two witnesses, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have power to shut up the heavens. Who else had this power in the Old Testament, by the way? Who could shut up the heavens and stop it from raining? Elijah the prophet. So that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. I'd love to have that power in the UK right now, wouldn't you? During the summer months. Shut up the heavens. Just let the sun shine. It's brilliant in this country. We get, we get so much rain. But in a place like Israel, where they hardly get any rain, when you shut up the heavens, it means people are going to die because there's nothing to drink. The crops will die. The animals will die. The people will die. When you shut up the heavens, it's serious in a place like Israel. So they have power to shut up the heavens so it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn water into blood. Who else had this power in the Old Testament? Moses. Moses. He turned the Nile into blood, didn't he? And to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Who else had the power to bring plagues? Moses. Moses. Now, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them. Now, this is a symbol. We can look at this when we do Revelation. This is a symbol of the Antichrist. The Antichrist is a future world leader. And by world leader, I mean somebody who leads the world like a world president. Okay. He is of Italian origin. He's not Jewish. He's a Gentile. He will fulfill the times of the Gentiles. He is an Italian world leader who will take central stage and he will become a one world dictator, a one world president, a one world king. And the Bible calls him the beast because he is the son of Satan. The beast that comes up from the abyss will attack these two men. He will overpower them and he will kill them. So the two witnesses are going to be killed by the Antichrist. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt. Now, both Sodom and Egypt were a place of judgment from God because of their wicked behavior. But this city that they're prophesying in, it's being figuratively called Sodom and Egypt. It's not really Sodom and Egypt. It's figurative speech. So how do we know what this city is? The very next verse says, where also their Lord was crucified. Where was Jesus crucified? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So we know the city that they're talking about here is Jerusalem, but God says that Jerusalem has become like Sodom and has become like Egypt. It has become corrupted uh, with perversity. 
It has become corrupted with idolatry. It has become like Sodom and it has become like Egypt. But this is where Jesus was crucified. It's Jerusalem. So these two prophets, these two witnesses will prophesy for three and a half years in the public square of Jerusalem until the Antichrist arises and kills them and puts them to death. Let's go to the next screen. Revelation 11, 9 to 13. For three and a half days, some from every people, tribe, language and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and they will celebrate by sending gifts to each other because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. So the Antichrist kills these two prophets. Their bodies are lying dead in the city square of Jerusalem. And now the whole world begins to celebrate because these men of God have been slain and they start to have a mini Christmas. They start to buy presents and wrap them up and give them to each other and exchange in presents and having celebrations and feasts and parties. Finally, the Antichrist has done something about these two truth speakers. He's killed them. But after three and a half days, the breath of life from God enters them and they stand up on their feet and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. So God now resurrects these two witnesses after they've been dead for three and a half days. He causes them to come back to life. They stand up on their feet. And as they look up to heaven, God says, now come up. And they begin to ascend from the earth, just like their savior did from the Mount of Olives. They begin to ascend back to God in physical resurrected bodies as their enemies look on, as the Antichrist looks on. At that same hour, there was a severe earthquake and a tenth of the city of Jerusalem collapsed. We know it's Jerusalem because of the previous context. 7,000 people are killed in the earthquake. Now look what happens and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. When Lazarus was res resurrected, they wanted to kill him. When Jesus was resurrected, they wanted to kill his disciples and his church. Now, the third sign of Jonah is given to Israel in full view of all the Jewish people. God now resurrects these two witnesses and sends an earthquake. And those who survive now, instead of cursing God and rejecting Jesus, now with the third and final sign of the prophet Jonah, they begin to give glory to the God of heaven. Now with the third sign of Jonah, salvation begins to come to the Jewish people living in Israel. And this is so important for you and so important for me. Because Jesus, when he was on the earth, said to Israel, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, what Jesus is saying, listen, Israel, until you acknowledge that I'm your Messiah, I'm not coming back. This is why throughout the writings and letters of Paul, he says the gospel must go to the Jew first and then secondly to the Gentile, the non-Jew. Because your salvation and my salvation is dependent on their salvation. We cannot be resurrected and enjoy the kingdom of God until all Israel is saved. Because they're still God's chosen people, whether you like it or not, whether you agree with that or not. Scripture is clear, black and white it's in the word. They're still his beloved. He loves Israel. He loves the Jewish people. And so should you. And with this third sign of Jonah, Israel now begin to turn from their worthless idols, their perversities, their following of the Antichrist. They now 
begin to give glory to the God of heaven. Because these two olive trees are now beginning to pour out through their death and resurrection. They're beginning to pour out into Israel the golden oil. And that causes Israel to burn brightly and to be saved. Does that make sense? Yes. See how Zechariah ties in with Revelation? Yeah? Let's have a look to see who these are. Let's get to the next screen. So who are the two witnesses of Revelation 11? Well, I think we have a few clues already. But when we read Luke 9, 28 to 31... The Lord of all the earth, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, takes Peter, James, and John up a very high mountain. This is Mount Hermon. And when they're on top of this mountain, all of a sudden, Jesus reveals to his disciples who he really is. He's not just this kind of weathered skinned carpenter from the Galilee in Israel. That's his physical body. Inside of the physical body, inside of this tent, the Shekinah resides. And on this occasion, Jesus begins to radiate and shine and reveal to his disciples who he really is. And he gives these three disciples a taste, a foretaste of what the kingdom of God on earth will be like. And Peter, James and John get to see it. So here's the Lord of all the earth radiating the Shekinah glory brilliance that he had. You read in the book of Exodus and you see throughout the Old Testament in the, in the temple of Solomon. Jesus now begins to radiate this glory. And as he does so, two men appear. Moses and Elijah. And let's read this story. About eight days after this, Jesus said, uh, he took Peter john and james with him and went up onto a mountain to pray as jesus was praying the appearance of his face changed his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning and now two men moses and elijah appeared in glorious splendor talking with jesus and they spoke about his exodus which he was about to bring to fulfillment at jerusalem so here's Jesus radiating the Shekinah. All of a sudden, two men appear and start having a conversation about Jesus and his coming exodus. Now, what's really, really weird about this is why are Moses and Elijah there? Why not Isaiah? Why not Ezekiel? Why not Jeremiah or Micah or Nahum? Or why not any of the other Old Testament prophets? Why these two? I mean, did Elijah ever die? No. You sure? Yeah, you are right, he didn't die. What happened to Elijah? He got taken up in the Shekinah. Looked like the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. The Shekinah glory came and took Elijah up whilst he was still alive. Elijah didn't die. And Moses didn't die either, did he? Not sure about that one. No, 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 doesn't say. Well, yeah, it does. <laughs> it does. Moses actually died on Mount Nebo. He was, he died. Moses physically died. But the problem here is you've got Jesus and two living men. They're not dead. They're not like Casper the ghost floating. Moses and Elijah are both standing there on a mountain having a conversation with Jesus. But Moses died. We know that Moses died. Moses sinned against the Lord by striking the rock a second time. And because of that, he had to die. So how is Moses now alive? Talking to Jesus. Oh, very good, Tarina. We're going to come to that. Let's go to the next screen. <laughs> Tarina is on the ball. Okay, so we know Elijah is coming back. Malachi 4 verses 5 to 6 says, God is speaking through Malachi. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you, Israel, before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. That's the tribulation period. He will turn the hearts of the parents back to the children and the hearts of the children back to the parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. So just before the tribulation occurs, before God pours out his judgments, Elijah is going to come back to Israel just before. And he needs to be there before because maybe for three and a half years he's going to be prophesying. But why is Elijah having to restore the love of the parents back to the children and the love of the children back to the parents? It's because when Jesus arrived, he said, I've not come to bring peace. I've come to bring sword. I've come to bring division, a sword. Now, from now on. A man will be against his child. A child will be against his 
mum and mum will be against her husband. You know, there's going to be division in the Jewish family as to who Jesus of Nazareth is. Some Jewish people will say he is our Messiah. Other Jewish people will say, no, he's the son of Satan. He's an enchanter. We can't trust him because they're listening to those corrupted, hypocr hypocritical rabbis, you see. Now, there are good rabbis out there. I'm not saying there aren't, but we're talking about the hypocritical ones. The false ones, the, the false shepherds of Israel. And so when Jesus came, he brought division into the Jewish family unit. Now, what is Elijah going to do? He's going to restore the family unit. How is he going to do it? By convincing the Jewish people that Jesus really is their Messiah. He's going to convince Israel that Jesus really is the Messiah. How is he going to do this? Maybe he's one of the two witnesses. Maybe it's through his resurrection from the dead that the golden oil will be poured out upon Israel and they'll be saved. Maybe. But what about Moses? Moses died, his physical body is on Mount Nebo, right? Buried. But Jude 9 gives us a little hint. He says, but even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil, about the body of Moses did not dare to condemn him for slander, but said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Why did Michael want Moses' body? What good is a rotting corpse? What good is a body once it's dead and buried? You don't need it for anything. Unless, perhaps, the reason Michael wanted the body of Moses was to bring Moses back. Seems the only logical explanation to me. I can't think of any other reason why somebody would want a dead body. Would you want a dead body? Yeah. Unless it's a steak or a pork chop or something like that, I'd eat that, but you're not gonna eat Moses' body. But why would you want Moses' body back? Maybe it's because the Lord had more plans for Moses. And maybe that's why Moses wasn't dead on the Mount of Transfiguration. That's why he was alive and having a conversation with Elijah and having a conversation with Jesus. Maybe. So maybe these two witnesses are the return of Elijah and Moses to the earth to bring Israel back to Jesus so that the kingdom of God can be established. Maybe. I'm about 80% convinced that's the case. There's always that little wiggle room of, mm, maybe there's two other men that has the same power as them. I'm pretty convinced though. Let's go to the final screen. Zechariah 12, 10 to 14. We now begin to see the results of the ministry of these two witnesses in Jerusalem. And look at what Zechariah says. Hundreds of years before Jesus was born. God says, and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, a spirit of grace and supplication, and they will look on me, God, the one they have. Yes. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. On that day, in the future, the weeping in Jerusalem will be as great as the weeping of Hadad Rimon in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn, each clan by itself, with their wives by themselves. The clan of the house of David and their wives, the clan of the house of Nathan and their wives, the clan of the house of Levi and their wives, the clan of Shimei and their wives, and all the rest of the clans and their wives. We are told here hundreds of years before Jesus was born that in the future, Israel will grieve and weep and wail when they realize who they have pierced through. They have pierced God. And on that day, we're told that God will pour out his spirit of grace. Spirit of grace, unmerited favor, God's charis power he's going to pour out his holy spirit upon the jewish people and when he does this it's going to be supplication they're going to start crying out to god in prayer and you know one of the things they're going to start crying out blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord we believe that jesus 
We believe that Yeshua is our Messiah now. We believe it. Moses and Elijah, the two witnesses, they told us who he was. We've seen them resurrected. We believe in the sign of Jonah now. And now the oil begins to pour from God because of these two men. The oil begins to pour and they get saved. Grace is poured out. The Spirit is poured out. They cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the moment Israel begins to recognize who her Messiah is, he returns. Jesus returns. And he returns to defend her. He returns to protect her. He, He returns to save her. And he marches out in glorious splendor. And by the breath of his mouth, he overthrows the Antichrist. With the breath of his mouth, he overthrows all the the armies of the world that are trying to kill Israel. You You see, anti-Semitism comes from Satan. Because the devil knows, if I can kill all the Jewish people, there will be no one on the earth to ask him to return. This is why we love Israel. This is why we protect the Jewish people. We don't agree with every decision they make. Of course not. They make some bad decisions sometimes. But we stand with them and we love them and we protect them because they are God's people. And your salvation and my salvation depends on their salvation. You want the kingdom of God to come? To the Jew first and then to the Gentile.